Welcome to the Unscripted Pharmacist Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Rutzart, and today we're joined with Michael Collins. Michael is the founder of SugarAddiction.com. He is also the organizer of the annual Sugar Summit, and he's had amazing guests on there, many of which some of you may recognize. This event brings together experts, enthusiasts, and discusses the latest research and strategies about overcoming sugar addiction. Michael has dedicated his career to helping individuals break free from grips of sugar and improve their overall health. Welcome, Mike. How are you? Thanks, Kyle. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. You've had some amazing people at your Sugar Summit. We have. But yeah. Um, and this is this is free to everybody, correct? The Sugar Summit? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's free. It's free. It's we're in our uh eighth year. Uh we've done eleven events. We used to do a couple a year. We're down to one a year, but yeah, it's it's pretty exciting. Over four hundred of the world's leading experts in the field. So every year. That's interesting. And it's and you you're interviewing them. I'm the interviewer, yeah. It's in January. Yeah. This is when everybody's <laughs> wanting to, to yes. start their, their <laughs> New Year's resolutions or whatever. So it's the timing is good. The timing's perfect. Yeah. Right around like the first week of January? Uh second. It's hard to get some people doing anything the first week, but yeah, the second week. Oh, that's that is really cool. Um yeah. okay, so tell us tell us as much as you're willing to share about your origin story as to how you got on into the sugar addiction, but I think we're all addicts and, and I think we're all addicted to something. I remember yeah. um, my, my mother-in-law, her, I, I told her, I said, you, you smoke. It's, mm -hmm. you're no different than the rest of us. Don't, don't put yourself in a, in a, in a bad place because we all have our vices. We all have our addiction. We all are chasing dopamine. Right. right. It's, it's why, but if, if we look at it from the perspective of like, Hey, we're all equal same same playing field we all are chasing dopamine because this is really how we're wired right what how, how did you discover this this addiction with sugar yeah no it's a good question you know and i have kind of the podcast version i'll try and keep it short but um you know i just grew up with it my mother was my favorite sugar junkie you know she just loves sugar gained okay. 60 pounds on my at my birth on a hundred pound frame and uh, she just loved sugar. And uh, it's kind of a sad story at the beginning because her mother died when she was only eight. And uh, so she, like they had to move in with my great aunt, who was not the nicest person in the world. And my grandfather was always working. So they said, they, he made a deal. They owned the country store across the way. She said, anytime my little, my mother came into that store, he made a deal with his cousin Jim, just give her the candy, give her whatever she wants, put it on my tab. And so she literally grew up believing, and, and I think people still do, and I think she died believing, and like a lot of people in the world, believe that sugar is love, baking and gifts and all this kind of stuff. And it's become a cultural phenomena in that way. And so that's just how I grew up. You know, I mean, we had, we were just covered up with candy and cookies and, you know, we couldn't afford soda, but we could afford uh, uh, Kool-Aid. Sugar. Three times, yes. three times the recipe, you know. Yeah, sugar on your Cheerios, and there'd oh, be like a like an inch thick at the bottom of the bowl. I was exactly correct. How we and and, and we had no, they did not like cool. say no or not, eat less or whatever. They didn't care. They, we had complete unfettered access to that sugar bowl for the Cheerios and the cornflakes, you know. Yeah, and you're drinking, you're eating your cereal with non-fat milk is what I had. Right. I mean, it was it was colored water, but it was loaded with sugar. It was like I don't know, like almost like a slice of bread for every cup, like fifteen. Oh, we had skim milk. That's how they used to make powder. <laughs> you couldn't afford the regular. That's right. So yeah, it was, uh, and and you know, so fast forward, you know, I ran into beer at fourteen or thirteen or fourteen or fifteen years old, and I knew this is an important part of the process and an important part of the hopefully the discussion is that. I knew that beer changed my state. I knew that I was a little shy and that I could talk, drink behind the high school and, and talk to girls at the dance, right? I knew it. Uh, they called, we called it liquid courage, right? Yeah. And so, but I didn't realize, I didn't until later on that for myself and for others, that sugar does the same thing. 
And, and a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of stuff about emotional eating and this, that it actually has the power like an alcohol or a drug to tamp down a feeling of fear or worry or pain or anxiety. And people like they don't realize that's what's happening to them. Like it's just so commonplace and so ubiquitous. So anyway, fast forward, I get sober at 28 and I read this book called Sugar Blues by a guy named William Duffy. And Duffy uh, eventually married Gloria Swanson, the famous movie star, right? And uh, so I, it somehow stuck in my head, and I eventually raised two sugar-free kids. And I had a regular life, regular career. And it wasn't until about 2009 I was kind of semi-retired. I made some money on real estate and online and stuff. And uh, I just started doing this. The kids said I should write a book. So in 2018, I did that. And it wasn't until the pandemic that this thing just took off. Like everybody was medicating, self-medicating. Their sugar habit jumped through the roof. There was no sugar or flour on the shelves because everybody was at home baking and everything. And the thing just took off. And, and it's been growing ever since. So that's the short version of how yeah. I ended up as the story, man. Mix some alcohol in with COVID. You know, I... I worked like crazy during COVID right? and I didn't get to do the kind of stay home. And I, I would have loved to have done this. This, this would have been a way more fun doing podcasts and meeting people like you. My life didn't change one iota. I was, I'd been working from home for 15 years at that time. So. You were just waiting for stuff to come inside your house. That's pretty much the only difference, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Quarantine your boxes and stuff. Right. Looking back, it's kind of funny, huh? Yeah. No. It oh isn't. my gosh. I don't okay. Know. So you put together this, this program. Yeah. What are the nuts and bolts of your program? Or what is the nuts and bolts of your philosophy? How, is there a, like a 12-step program? How do you get people to recognize? Because I find this like the critical step one. Yeah. You have to admit that you're an addict. You have to say to yourself, hey, I'm weak. I got this, this fault about myself. I've been chasing dopamine. I, I need help. That is, to me, that's the most humble place to be and recognize that you aren't perfect and that you need some help. Yeah. It's usually what opens the door to a different mindset or a new technique that people get out of this rut of living the same six months over and over and over again mm -hmm. and start taking back their life and going, all right, I, there are things that I can control. So how do, how do you go about the whole recognition and, and the process to help people get off of sugar? Well, you nailed it on the head. I mean, that is absolutely the first step. It's literally half the battle if you can, yeah. you know, just say that I'm whatever it is, whatever you need change, you know, whatever change in your life that you want to have. But in this particular <laughs> addiction, this particular malady, this particular change process, there is massive, massive resistance, okay? It's been for me, who's kind of a marketer his whole life, a real marketing and awareness puzzle because people are struggling with sugar, very desperately struggling with sugar, except they don't want to admit that they're struggling with sugar. They don't okay. want to, like, and they don't want to even fathom the idea that they would have to live without it in 100% abstinence, right? Mm -hmm. Just because it seems like the entirety of society is doing uh, is eating sugar with impunity and they don't have any real worries about it. Right. Even if they're overweight. So it's strange because our clients and, and this is across the board, all the people I've interviewed is exactly the same. My goal is to get it down to childbearing age women and men for sure. But 95 percent of our clients are women. And they're, uh, I like to say between 40 and 80, but they're really between 55 and 80, 50 or 55 and 80. And I personally believe that they have struggled with body image and weight and dieting their entire life and have narrowed it down to that they, the parts of diets that they cannot do, the one part of dieting they cannot do, which is the sugar. Okay. And 
now, you know, the summits have proven to me that the science has caught, caught up with this idea that biochemically about a third of people cannot ingest sugar. Okay. And it's all well and good. I've been starting to talk about this body versus addiction or body versus brain phenomena. For a hundred years, we've studied sugar and it's really accelerated in the last five or seven years since the summit started. And people are still talking about it. They're still talking about diabetes, weight gain, heart disease, and about a hundred other things that sugar uh, exacerbates or causes. The problem is, is they do not talk about how to stop and no one can functionally do it alone. So you ask what the core of the process is. The core of the process is community, plain and simple. It's community. You have to have a group of people who've done it before you and are doing it with you because in this society, you are an odd man out, odd woman out, um, and they just, you know, they just can't see. 80% of our folks do not have spousal support, okay? Ooh, that's hard. That's hard. That's a, that's a setup for failure. It is. Or, it, and then, and then those that do, how many of them have spouses that are willing to sabotage their best efforts? And you're getting this. Yeah. You're hitting this where the rubber hits the road. Yeah. No, I mean, you're it, right. You can't you know, do this alone. It's grassroots uh, from the bottom up. A lot of people are working on policy down or whatever, but that's not going to fly, really. I don't think it's, it'll you, be a long time. It'll be a long time. I don't think sugar will ever be illegal, but it will, be, on. it will be an adult treat in our lifetime. Uh, yeah. It's going to be black market. You're going to have to sign for it. That's my yeah. hope. <laughs> I, I would I would like that. You know, I raised a couple of sugar-free kids. You know, people are really like they genuinely believe that sugar is love that they have that they would be depriving their children of a childhood if they didn't give them sugar oh, Which, how could you be so mean it's ridiculous. how could you how could i bet you heard that your entire time as an parent oh, absolutely you're cruel yeah we had to fight. halloween yeah easter christmas right. now listen about easter and halloween they didn't start out as sugar soaked holidays now they, they oh, were man manufactured by this sugar producer right? <laughs> they I, was a, I was a total sugar sugar addict I, yeah, yeah. I'm oh sweet. man i loved winding myself up and watch me go just yeah. getting really hyped up and just like all right i'm i'm, I'm gonna go like on a bike for, on a treadmill or on a, on a little cycle for like an hour and see how far i can go like it was just wind me up and then there was that crash crash exactly. that crash yeah. i mean i I basically grew up on peanut butter jelly and, and macaroni and cheese. It's probably why I'm five, six, one sixty. But I mean, I was so addicted to sugar. Right. I, I didn't care how it was gonna come. I just needed that pain to go away. That was right. the only thing I felt. Yeah. But I didn't but you go so much aware. deeper than that. You, you were aware of that at that age. That's good. I mean yeah. I loved it. Hyper. Yeah. No, it's it, the whole thing to me is just super fascinating. I mean, people can see it when when the cake and ice cream comes out at a five and six or seven year old birthday party. Like all these shy kids who wouldn't talk to one another are now losing it, literally, physically bouncing off walls. And people are like, you know, like by the time you get to be an adult, all you're doing is fighting off withdrawals at that point. You know what I mean? You're yeah, not you're chasing you're not the dragons anymore. You're just I don't want to feel crappy for three days in a row, you know? Yeah. I, I would get the shakes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The, the, the detox symptoms are pretty extreme for some people. Yeah. Walk us through that. Cause I, I mean, there's a lot of people that are super hesitant and, yeah. and, and yes, there, there is, there is so much light at the end of this tunnel, but oh. maybe, maybe walk us through like maybe a, a typical withdrawal over say the course of a week. What can people expect? So, you know, the first seven to 10 days, 15 days, if you had a bad habit are the most crucial and that where most people turn back and they don't put two and two together and say that they're feeling depressed and blue and shakes and sweating at night 
and not sleeping and hungry all the time and irritable. You want to kick the dog. You're just, you're, you don't even like yourself. You're like irritable. Every, everything irritates you. Literally the sun irritates you because <laughs> it's like, no, it's seriously. Cause it's like, you know, it's too bright and whatever. Uh, too. So you got headaches and, you know, you're, you're lethargic and it's just, it's nasty, you know? So this and is not something you want to do on vacation, huh? No, you need to have a little bit of time, like rest time. Okay. In your program, we tend to get off caffeine as well. So when you put those two, like quitting those two detoxes together, by about the fourth or fifth day, if you had any habit at all, you are incapacitated. Like you are just right. in bed and, you know, you, and a lot of people turn to you know, a lot of pain relievers or, mm. you know, they have diarrhea or constipation. They go try and get something over the counter. Or they ramp up their Valium or their, you know, alcohol even sometimes, you know, because right. they're self-medicating themselves. Substituting. You know? Yeah. They're so substituting they're, one dopamine hit for another. Uh, exactly. This addiction transfer is real and it happens very quickly and, pe and, and very imperceptibly. People don't realize they're doing it. Um, the Amazon boxes start showing up. You, you, you substitute shopping or whatever, you know, if you're right. a game you know, you gamble, sex, you know, this, everything, they'll substitute something, you know, they'll, they'll, they're going to get, like you say, the dopamine, I'm glad you, you're, you know, you're aware of it. And, and I want to tell the folks that when I use the word dopamine, I mean, dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, oxytocin, adrenal glands, endorphins, cannabinoid receptors, every brain and body reward system is affected by sugar. And dopamine just happens to be the popular one right now. And, uh, and dopamine is, you know, well, well researched and that, you know, you down regulate your dopamine receptors, you thin them out, you have less of them. Okay. And so this, and, and in order to just feel normal, to feel even, you've got to have those hits of sugar all day. And when you quit, there's that time period where you got to heal up and you got to start. There's no good evidence that, um, dopamine receptors regenerate, but there is evidence that new ones are formed. And so you can do other things for dopamine. You know, you can take a walk, get a hug, go for a run, watch a sunset, make good food, get a manicure, get a pedicure, get a massage, go, you know, whatever. Right. Yeah. A lot, of be a lot better ways to do it than sugar. Yeah. But I would yeah, say you're that's... probably gaining more of that instead of that pleasure. You're gaining more of that happy hormone. You're, you're getting something that's a little more lasting, especially if you're you doing are, something. You're getting different. serotonin. You're getting better, better, you know, and you're literally grooving a new neural pathway. You have yes. to, people have to realize, and this is really important, and it kind of along the themes of this, um, you've, we've literally outsourced our emotional management system to sugar, okay? We have, it's a very common construct in the world of alcohol and drugs that in recovery, that if you had started using alcohol and drugs at 14 or 15, you stopped growing emotionally. Okay. And so think about it. If you extrapolate that backwards to four, five, and six, when there was chaos in your life of any kind, um, your parents were busy, they'd hand you a cookie, send you to TV, you know, send you to the TV, you, your, your small brain and that neural pathway that you grooved, the solution to your worry, fear, anxiety, pain, fear, anything was sugar. Okay. And that, you know, taken to the extreme over a lifetime leads to a lot of bad problems. And you literally have to realize that you've got to go rewire that four or five year old brain. Likely it happened in the womb, but definitely by four or five or six, you were wiring a brain that outsourced its, and not consciously, you don't think like the end of a week, you know, I got to have a beer because it's been a rough week. You just do it. You just, there's a little tinge of fear or worry or guilt. You just have a soda and it goes away, right? And this compounds like compound interest over and over and over again until you're 45 years old, you're 45 pounds overweight, and, you know, you're just kind of, you, you cannot stop because when you stop, all of the things we talked about detoxing happens and, and you know that to stop that detox, just one little bit of chocolate, one bit of soda, and it goes away, right? And so it, it, it takes about the arc of a podcast like this to kind of explain 
what the norm, the un, the the phenomena of everyone who loses any amount of weight gains it all back in the first year, ninety five percent of people. Right. And if you use the explanation that I just give you gave you, you can plug it into that phenomena and understand that when you started the the, the diet, quote unquote. You reduced the white stuff. You, your life was okay. Things were going well. Finances, relationship, career, everything was okay. Kids, everything was okay. Then six months later, you've lost 50 pounds and something happens. A little upset financially, relationship. Yes, right. You just fall back, right? Because you go back to the process, the, the emotional management process system that worked, right? You're familiar and, hell. Yeah, you're familiar go to exactly <laughs> yes and that's yeah. you know it's like again it takes someone hearing this story out and me watching you know over 20,000 of these de- detoxes to see the the arc of of the pattern you know what i mean to see right. it. at this juncture for us it's just pattern recognition right. you know i can tell to the day depending on your habit your size you know what your first 30 days are going to look like. Oh, that's really helpful. But I, I agree that this happens at such an early age. I think of it like, um, like a mountain and the storm dumps on that mountain, you know, six inches of water and these tracks, these grooves in your brain, in your behavior, in your being erodes away and gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And then to build these tracks back with something you know, that you've translated to a better habit like exercise. Oh my gosh. The, the times I have gotten my, my hit from exercise is, uh, it's never ending, but I find that it's the most, uh, when I do high intensity, Yeah. when I, when I do high intensity, that it seems like the endorphins are a little bit higher. I'm still a junkie. Yeah. Right. I, I I'm always going to be a junkie, but I, I want to be a junkie to the right things. Yeah. Right. I want to be a slave to exercise and the anxiety that comes with not doing it. I need to get rid of this anxiety. This is the only way I know how. Right. Instead yeah. of self soothing with food. Right. Which would be the easy fix. Yes. Right. So I mean, I I see this frequently, but I think we gotta give ourselves some slack, and I'm sure you do. Hey, this is not going to be easy. Right. rewriting these deep tracks and laying something different down. is going to take some repetition, but you yeah. talk about taking back that brain, taking back the mind and going, Hey, you know what? This is what we're doing today. I have control over my brain. I'm going to fuel you properly and you're going to serve me well. So how do you help people get, take back that brain of theirs as an organ? Yeah, I know. That's a, that's kind of the, the golden key to the golden lock, isn't it? Right. And yeah. so, this kind of empowerment, it, it mostly, again, comes from the community. You know, we've got four to five Zoom meetings a day, support meetings a day, every day. You're only a few minutes away from talking to a certified coach and and, and kibitzing with your community group of, who are literally the same person. You know, they're literally the same person yeah. doing it with you, right? And, you know, it kind of belies the whole other way of trying to do this, which, you know, bariatric or uh, Ogovi or Ozempic or something, you don't get the empowerment, the internal empowerment that I can do hard things if you don't do it this way, our way, you know, and I want to say our way, but the way that is probably the most helpful way. Um, you, you, you're out again. You're, you may not be outsourcing it you're, to sugar. You're outsourcing it to a surgeon. You're outsourcing it to a pill or an injection or whatever. Mm-hmm. You just can't do it that way. I mean, everybody knows that nothing worthwhile in life is any good, and let, you know, there's always a little bit of work to it, a little bit of struggle to it. And this right. is no different. You know, this this change process this transformation process. You know, everybody comes originally for weight loss. They think that it's weight loss. And and that is a very nice byproduct of this process. But the real process, at the end of the day, you know, the the evidence is very clear now. And they are they have work groups trying to get this into the ICD-10 of the World Health Organization and the DSM um, in the United States 
This is a substance use disorder. Okay. This is a drug addiction. And we don't have that classification yet. No, we do not. And that is so crazy. I mean, it has a physical withdrawal. Yeah, no. And, and you know, they're like, that's insane. It's just insane, really. I mean, the groups, you know, I'm part of the group helping with the publicity and the whole fundraising and all that kind of stuff, too. So, you know, they're working very hard and it's going to happen in the next iteration of either one of these books. But um, it just hasn't happened yet. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because um, people don't realize that this, quote unquote, recovery, this change, this transformation is in essence a codependency recovery. It's a drug addiction recovery. And people think of codependency as this relationship you have with others. But in reality, it's this relationship you have with yourself, your self-talk, your confidence, your, you know, uh, and, and this is the, beyond the detox, beyond the first 30 days, that, that's where the work begins, okay? So that you don't substitute something else, so that you don't, you know, um, uh, crash and burn on some other, you know, start drinking or whatever. Um, and it's really important that people understand this. And this is the difficulty because some people are like, I don't want to be an addict. You know, there's a stigma to it, even if it's just quote unquote, just sugar. And I actually believe that the dose makes the poison and we take a little heroin and we take a little bit of alcohol and a little bit of by comparison, anybody with any habit at all is pounding 30, 40, or 50 teaspoons of sugar a day, right? And we are just, our nervous system, our dopamine system never gets a break. It just starts the next day with about 20 minutes of that first, whatever it is in the morning, coffee and sugar and donut. They get that little bit of relief, and then the whole rest of the day, they're chasing the same high. And people don't like my drug analogies a lot of times, but the people that accept them, which is one of the principles of drug addiction recovery, the people that accept it, they get well, they get thin, they get healthy. I don't know. I don't, I'll get off my soapbox. I'm sorry. But how, okay, so. Okay, so I can't relate to the majority of the world, which this sucks, uh, although I knew I was a sugar addict. Right. But I, I didn't have a choice. When I said, all right, I'm going to be teaching diabetes classes, I can't go in the break room and just start shoving candy in my mouth and eating a bunch of donuts and pizza. Like I had to, right. I was like, okay, the world is watching me. There's no way I, this is, whether I like it or not, if I'm going to be true to my word, this has to go. So right. I didn't go through the full on withdrawal. But recognizing that I have weaknesses and that these are temptations and, and this is who I am and get out of automatic zone and go, all right, what am I feeling right now? What, why, why do I have this craving? Yeah. You know, right. Why, where is this coming from? Is there something that I'm feeling that I need? So it took like a lot of mindfulness and a lot of change but at the same time i really feel like fueling the brain kind of made all the difference and yeah. i know that i know that you know a lot about the ketogenic diet and and helping with addiction recovery as well as cravings yeah so i'm sure you talk about that in your in your sugar summit every every year and i'm sure you have more data more evidence to show that man mental illness and this brain energy problem as you know indicated by christopher palmer from his book brain energy is that hey we could combat a lot of these problems through fixing our sugar addiction right oh i i you know i couldn't agree more you know i've had chris on three four times and and uh, i just love the evolution of one of our summits is was is a brain summit like a brain and emotion summit and it all the the research on fructose in the brain and the brain in general has just exploded in the last three to five years and really just given credence, if you will, to the addiction understanding um, that, you know, 12 steps and other people have come up with over the years. And so I, you know, the whole brain energy, the whole brain 
uh, what is it? Uh, there's two couple new books. More they come out every day now. Uh, George Ede of Harvard. George Ede. Yeah. That just keeps coming, and you know, a few of my contemporaries uh, will not work with vegetarians simply because they're they need to eat too many grains, too many fruit, too much. They they they're just too high in in carbohydrates in general. In in, in sugar addiction, in true sugar addiction recovery, right? Because it just keeps you craving, keeps the cravings alive. You don't get enough healthy fats. You don't get enough ketones. You don't get enough ketogenic you know, lifestyle kind of stuff. Now there's, we've had guys on who are the most famous vegetarians in the world. Dr. Gabriel Cousins, who's a raw food vegan, but raw, what Dr. Cousins eats basically a raw food keto diet. He only eats greens, avocados, and olives. I said, Gabriel, that doesn't sound like a lot of calories. He says, Michael, I don't eat for calories. I eat for energy. And so you have to get those healthy fats in, in one way or the other. And the ketogenic diet and the, even the carnivore diet now seem to be, uh, you know, proving out. And these guys are real sciencey. You know, they're very sciencey, much more scientifically, scientific, more sciencey than vegans and vegetarians. And I'm just a firm believer that, you know, addiction is a brain illness in general. It, you know, and we've always known. Nora Volka has been talking about this for 10 or 15 years and now find people are listening to her. It's not a you know, moral issue or moral failing or personal weakness. It is a brain illness, you know, just like schizophrenia and, and bipolar. These things are being healed and cured, literally cured using that word. Shouldn't probably, but um, cured. You're off your meds. Yeah. You're off your meds by diet, by diet, you know, by changing right. your diet. You know, entire nonprofits are being set up. The Bozinski organization, a lot of they're being set up so that um, you know this study can be can, these studies can move forward. Right. Um, and it's not funded and, by industry, so this is difficult. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> and, and, and it takes a lot because you got to think about it. Like, in order to sequester someone in a hospital and change their diet, so you know they're not getting anything else, it's expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when it's not funded, you know, like where are you going to get the money to metabolically house somebody, do a metabolic ward, right. here, and then and then to do it for a long period of time, and then to figure out what's going on inside the brain. Right. I mean, these studies, these are difficult. Yeah, all the diagnostic tools. One guy I love is uh, Richard Johnson, who does doing uh, fructose research, which is not that old, really. And yeah. uh, you know, he's got a grant from the NIH to that he believes if he can. Um, if he can block the fructose pathway, he can cure alcoholism, right? And so there's, it's all yeah. kind of combined up there in the brain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and people, I think the part that's difficult is the lack of acceptance yet right now for the idea that sugar can be as powerful a psychoactive, uh, mood-altering, uh, emotion-tamping-down drug as the drugs and the alcohol, you know? So yeah, it's but, uh, it, it's, it's it's happening, but it's happening slowly. It kind of makes sense. I've had to look at sugar as your poison. It's skull and crossbones. <laughs> right. I've I've seen I've seen the mechanism for what it does, and this goes for not just fructose, but ethanol as well as excess amount of glucose, which Richard Johnson talks about. How we make our own fructose. This yep. is still going to lead to this wicked uric acid. Yeah, I don't want that, right? Yeah. So I've I've had to look at this. This is this is a toxin. This is like plastic. I don't eat plastic. This is like Roundup. I don't eat Roundup. I don't eat these poisons. Yeah. So that was the only way that I could get beyond that. But I'm sure you have other techniques, mindsets for people to say, how am I going to recognize sugar in my life? How am I going to? Uh, how can I re-identify it as something that really is an unnatural? thing that exists right it, it's it's hardly natural at all in its right. purified form and its refined form yeah how do you how do you change that mindset no that's a that's a good question and it it you know they they're trying to there's something out of uh, south america called the nova system where um they um have four tiers of food and the i forget whether it's one or four but uh the last one is ultra processed carb or ultra processed food. You know, the first one is just original from the original tree or the animal or whatever. And then the fourth one is ultra processed food. 
And I think that awareness is they're using that to it's what it's got one little glitch in it. Um, you know, cause they, they are not addiction experts, but other than that, I think that that thing is making a, a run at public awareness. Um, and, and people just need to, I think the, the, the delineator, the, the, the draw, you know, the line in the sand, if you will, is that people have to realize that this is a process like cocaine, you know, coca leaves are very different. Coca leaves to chew them gives you a little caffeine buzz. That's about it, you know. But when you process it, you, you're, you're talking about a different deal. You know, when you powderize it or then even farther to crack, it's just much more powerful. And the same thing happens to sugar when they process this, these plants into a powder. I call it powder addiction because I just don't think the body was made to have powder. Like you might get a little sand on your plant or your animal. Right. But you, the body doesn't really know what to do with this much powder. And I talk about all powders, you know. From, yeah, they don't really exist know, in nature. You'd have, to, you'd have to have dried it. But you wouldn't go yeah, through that have, process, right? You wouldn't be having that much of it. You know, our, our body was not made to have Chewing that. on some sugar cane? Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. And, but we, when we do it, you know, it's just like literally doesn't even have to get to the stomach. It's like absorbed right in the mouth. Or whatever. Right. You know, Immediate. Your brain, like... Um, and so if people will make that, draw that line in the sand and say, these are, you know, and accept the idea that they are this powerful and that they can do damage in this. I mean, they already know. I always, like I said before, I'm, I'm separating out the body guys with the brain guys. And for a hundred years, we've told them about what it's doing to the body and they can see it in the mirror and the weight and stuff, but somehow they cannot like because the culture has not caught up with this idea of the science. And this happens. It happened in cigarettes. It happened in drinking and driving. When the, the, society, when the science True. says, okay, it's time to change, and it just there's a lag. And we're in the middle of that lag. You know, we're, we're in the middle of people being aware. So, and so you guys, guys. Right, like right, Robert Lustig, right? People yeah, who are do. making us all totally aware of the science. Does that yeah. change people's uh, that's because that's kind of how I, I operate. I, well, if I can objectively see this is what it does. These are the side effects I'm going to experience. This is why I'm avoiding it. These are like, I'm sure a lot of people don't need the science. I'm sure a lot yeah. of people don't, don't it's operate. So, like that. It's so interesting because this has been my thought problem for a decade now. This has been my, there's a book that's it's about 20 years old now called um, what is it? Um, Change or Die, I think is the name of it. And it's it, it, fear and facts, and there's another one. Fear and facts and something else doesn't change people. It, it's wow. like people, you know, the common kind of example he uses, I got to reread it, but common fact is like people smoking cigarettes. And then they're smoking them through their trach tube or they oh, continue yeah. smoking after they got half their lung cut out or heart disease, same kind of stuff, right? Same kind of addiction stuff or people who can't get sober or can't whatever, like their fear or information. I've discovered uh, you, you'll like this is a, a new kind of worry or fear. People are information junkies, okay? They come to me with so yeah. much damn information. About, they know more than me about food and macros and blah, 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 whatever. But they still can't quit sugar, right? And so I dope, one day I just Googled information gather, gathering and dopamine. And up pops yeah. like hundreds of peer-reviewed studies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love and this you stuff. Little, you know, you get a little – so you're going from let me gather some information, a new diet – and let me maybe introduce sugar and I'll start tomorrow. Let me gather some new information back and forth. Yeah. Back and forth. It's I'm not like, ready yet. I'm not ready yet. It's I like got to be, shopping. I got to have everything. It's like the shopping or the sex or some, what it's like, uh, you know, that game, um, whack-a-mole. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> one comes up. Bam. You got to get another one. You can get one table, you got to get another one, you know? Yeah. I don't play that so, anymore, but yeah. I think people are, they also fear just being alone. They feel like they are going to be like basically on this deserted island, socially yeah. isolated. And that is so scary because, yeah, you're going to lose some friends. You're going to look different. 
you're going to be a different person. You're, you may have to make some changes in your social life to right. be successful. But is there, is, is there a, like a support where this is kind of what I thought is after people finish like their 90 day weight loss that they go and they, um, they have support. They have people that they can text, people that they can call when they're in a tight spot and say, hey, I, I, I'm reaching out because I have a need. And right now my well, process is breaking down for me. You are absolutely describing, you know, what is commonly known as recovery. And, and you know, I love the phrase uh, in the drug and alcohol world that treatment is discovery and meetings are recovery. Okay. And so you're, you're, you're in a situation where, and we have this, like we have uh, a community that is, they have book clubs and sewing clubs and whatever. It's not necessarily, you know, once you're past your 90 days, you're, you're solid, then you have to have this community. It's the whole peer thing. I'm a big fan of peer, peer healing, peer um, recovery, it's called really. And it's the only thing that's ever worked in drug and alcohol and now there's a lot of peer-reviewed science that if you were, say, a cancer survivor, right, the people that join cancer survivor support groups go, you know, double, triple, quadruple their success of long-term uh, health If besides the people that go it alone, right? And so it's really – it's like we are tribe animals. We need to do this stuff together. And you said it perfectly – if you're the guy who st- gal who stops and doesn't do it anymore, you are the odd person out. You know, your family thinks you're crazy. They don't want to put up with your changes in their diet or their, you know, their celebration food or anything. And so you have to belong to another tribe. You don't necessarily, you don't have to leave your family of origin, your tribe of origin. You're still a brother, a sister, a mother, a, you know, but you've got to like have another group of people that believes as you do and that have had success and that have gotten thinner and gotten healthier and their skin has cleared up and all these good things have happened to them. And you can just level, you can just be accepting of your older tribe. You know what I mean? That's the only way I've ever seen it work. I don't care how much science you got. I don't care how much, you know, like, um, how brilliant you are. It's, it cuts across socioeconomic stuff, you know. Older tribe. I like that. Family is your older tribe. The way people used to remember you is kind of that older tribe. Yeah. But not, but you, you are definitely different. You, you, I mean, I, you got to redefine yourself. You do. And, and you can embrace that process of redefining yourself and embrace who you are now, or you can kind of hide yeah. Right. Like you, you do feel really different. Painted yourself on a corner here. Like your, your diet is so outlandish that like no one, everybody looks and people at you. Will criticize almost, you oh yeah. They're bothered you be, by you. <laughs> you gotta be strong, you know, and usually you're criticized by people who are secretly wishing they knew how to do what you did. But yeah, they don't have the guts to ask. They don't, they don't want to go there. Yeah, because then you become part of their tribe or they become part of your tribe. Look, honestly, look, they're not doing it maliciously. They do. This is the very tribal kind of human uh, organism importance that they actually feel that you are in danger, that you are leaving that tribe. Right. So they're not doing it maliciously to say, oh, quit the diet. You lost 50 pounds. Have some cake. They're not doing it because they want you to be fat and unhealthy. They're doing it because they feel like you might really actually go to another tribe and fall out of their tribe. And it's very deep. And, you know, it's not something that is conscious, I don't believe. And again, I, really, I don't I appreciate, believe it. I, I really appreciate you saying that because I think a lot of you, you obviously give help beyond, you know, you're looking for long term. Oh, yeah, that's our, here. That's. That's, that's, that's our, so that, helpful. That's our, that, you know, our thing is the, you know, like I, I'd always use this example. So if you want to know how popular this is as a bolt on to all every damn weight loss and weight training and diet and everything, just type into the Google search or the, excuse me, the Facebook search bar, sugar detox group. 
you will be scrolling for half an hour or two. Really? Hours. Yeah. That just, many. It just never ends. Okay. Because people have tried to straight, create this group, but they always, these three day, five day, seven day, 10 day, 21 day detoxes are just another diet. It's, it's just another diet without the long term lifestyle changes they they just don't make it you know they it, it's just that whole yo-yo up and down up and down thing and and the people who are bolting this onto their diet program or their shake program or their weightlifting program they are doing more of a disservice because you know they'll get 10 days off sugar go right back to where they were thinking that they can just whatever start again you know or not you know not do it long term and they're never educating on the addiction piece of the puzzle, which is kind of sad too. Right. I mean, it's, it's willpower will only get you so far. You can feel motivated every day, but by, by the end of the day, that willpower is going to eventually drain. Yeah. And then it's- you're still going to be left to your own devices and your excuses for why you need to celebrate or why you need to bury your sorrows. Right. Instead of dealing with our emotions and I construct a conscious level that what you just said is the um, barrier sorrows thing. Like most people don't know they're doing that. They don't, they, they don't yeah. think they, they, they've never been taught this. They've never been taught that that's what's happening. They're on automatic. They're on yeah. auto zone. They just, just they're keep doing your number thing. So a bit ubiquitous. There's so much of it around yeah. and it's so inexpensive. Even a child can score it almost free. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Children is a significant problem. Are you doing, um, are you helping children as well? Recognize a sugar addiction. So this is interesting. So I, I we did a, uh, a sugar free kids summit, right? Cool. It's the first time I was ever thanked by every one of the speakers, you know, it's weird. Yeah. Because your kid, they, did your kids get to speak? My, they did actually. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, That's awesome. it's, so, you know, it's like, um, but, and this is a huge but, as I said at the opening of this thing, is that um, the client is still a woman, 50 to 80, who, who the, the younger ch- younger women are not taking this seriously yet um, because they are, you know, it, it's so cute to give the kid whatever. I don't know. They're in that other tribe. But... Um, we do have some people that have younger kids, but it's very rare. And I'm not alone. This is every, all my contemporaries that do the same thing, same thing. So again, you know, a woman could find out she's pregnant. And even if she has a substance use disorder with alcohol or drugs, she will quit that day. Done. Really? Like she'll. That's impressive. Okay. And then, so. Yeah. And, but not sugar. Not sugar. <laughs> just, just as uh, you know, I'm I'm not trying to lay down excuses for the under fifty women here, right? But let me let's lay down an excuse. You know, you're cycling, right? You have these huge like oh, uh, your when your progesterone levels elevated, the the cravings are out of control, and like I I, I kind of get where that there could be some hormonal differences. Well, the, it's so funny because the um, your period changes so drastically off sugar and flour. It it just like it's lighter, it's not as painful, because what is it? What is a uh, PCOS? But 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 a detox, right? Mm. Of sorts, a, a, a shedding of healing and healing. Right. And so, it, I mean, across the board, women that are still having their period talk about it being easier and less. And I might mention that I've got a couple of women pregnant without being even in the same state. Because, and one of my favorite guys, uh, yeah. carnivore guy, Dr. Rob Kiltz, he runs one of the largest fertility clinics in the world. And he says, the first thing you do is quit sugar and flour before you even like, like work on anything next. There's no, yeah. no step two until you yeah. do that. And that resolves a lot of the folks. Oh, yeah. So uh, PCOS, PCOS is actually pretty simple as far as fixing. But yeah, you might yeah. be responsible for someone that's fertile that wasn't fertile before. Well, yeah, they didn't think it, so they didn't take any precautions or whatever. You know, they just didn't yeah. think they'd get pregnant, and then they all of a sudden they're sixty days, ninety days, a hundred days into sugar, no sugar, and they're getting pregnant. And, so much uh, healing, so much healing. You think so, about just the just the gut alone, yeah. allowing the gut to finally heal from the insults of sugar. 
Wow. Oh, the gut stuff is so fascinating. Yes. I mean, the, the dysbiosis. Functions, the the veli are longer when it's got a lot of fructose. It, yeah. There's just, a, especially, yeah. you know, this uh, colloquial kind of uh, every man phrase of leaky gut is really sugar. It's fructose yeah. loosening up the tight junctions, you know. Right. And can't keep the sewer where it belongs. Instead, the sewer is coming in, which is triggering right. this massive war with the immune system. Yeah. And so these people have this elevated immune system and they don't, and they wonder why they just, I don't have the energy. Well, cause you're inflamed. You have no idea how much better life could be. I kind of yeah. wish that people could see what you and I see when yeah. we first meet somebody you're like, Hey, you know what? You are going to look so much different in six months. You are going to be like, if, if you do what I tell you to do, like this is going to feel amazing. From you have your- no idea. Yeah, you have no I- idea how optimal really feels. You think you feel good, but you have no idea. It just gets better. From your lips to God's ears. If we can figure out this thought problem of that future pacing of people understanding exactly what you just said, the, we can solve the metabolic. You know, one of the things I'm excited about is CGMs. Okay, so continuous. Ah, so love it. Just, you know, once those things go under a hundred bucks. And they're non-invasive and you can wear it on your watch and just say, uh oh. <laughs> right. The whole world changes. But you're because- you still you still have this really important point, which is what you're doing, is they need somebody on the other end. Yeah. They do. the encouragement, like I've seen people wearing these things, like, what do you wear? Uh, it's for my diabetes. Like it, like it's what is it doing? I don't never look at it. Like, no, you must look at this. This is the point of wearing this. Yeah. So having someone that you're being accountable, someone's looking over my shoulder, oh boy. People who who have someone looking over their shoulder tend to perform better, right? Right, knowing that someone's watching them. You're right. CGMs are, yeah. I you can't it, unsee that information. Man. You can't unsee. Yeah, it. but sugar, you only see half. Yeah. You don't get to see the fructose, but you have a really good idea. Like, all right, if my if my glucose levels are elevated, my insulin level is definitely elevated. It is definitely up there, and I'm in storage mode, and I'm getting fatter by the second. Right. That's kind of what I want people to start realizing. And when they look and this, I don't think that the CGM can be like AI guided. I, I feel like I need somebody on the other end of that line. Mm. Yeah. You know? no. Not this slowly. good. Yeah. Versus, oh, bing, you know, my blood sugar got to, you know, under a hundred and I got on a nice little notice, you know, I'm, I'm racking up some points. I don't know. Maybe some people enjoy like a game system, but it's like I, a video game. It's like dialing your health with a video game. Like you're a, yeah. you're a pharmacist. You know this probably, but they've already got three approvals for um, no prescription required for CGMs. Did you know that? Yeah, there's, a, there's Stello from Stello. Abbott that's going over the counter. It should be like any day now, but I, I think it's going to be expensive. Well, I don't know that it's going to be any more expensive than the levels and the nutrisense uh, things that are – they, they had to build an infrastructure with a doctor in every state so they could get a prescription in every state. Right. And so these guys are like, you know, they're going right by that. So this makes and these no, guys are all big fun. I know, but this makes no sense. You can get aspirin over the counter, which could, is lethal, right? But yeah. you want to like lock up a glucose monitor. You can get a regular glucose monitor for like 20 bucks and stick right. yourself up. You, you could stick yourself... I think it's like almost 300 times in one day to get what you can get with the CGM in one out of 14 days, right? Yeah, What's, uh, why, why would you settle for the photograph when you can have the whole movie? Yes. This, I'm telling you, this is, to me, I think this is the tool. These sensors, the, can, the aura yeah. rings, the watches, they're so helpful. The whole world changes, really. Yeah. Like, they're close with the non-invasive where it's just on a watch and stuff, but nothing has yet been... Um, you know, uh, accurate yeah. that they would yeah. just, that they would approve it. But like, so you'd be, you'd be not- down for like, cause there's a couple more. I think uric acid is going to be another one. Yeah. Right. So you're close on fructose, like you, yeah. can, you can do a fructose breath test, but it, you know, you got to send right. it off and stuff. But right now I think they've got one that you can blow, but it's not, not all the way there yet. But and yeah, got- the combination is going to be awesome. Right. We got one for ethanol. How yeah. helpful would that be when it comes to recovery as well? Yeah. Absolutely. Hey, I saw that your ethanol level went up. You know, can we talk about it? Let's go on. What's going on? How are you feeling? That well, kind of like, 
the biohacking in general, it's like people are like willy nilly taking supplements or doing this, that, and the other without measuring first, whether it's blood uh, or, you know, a CGM or whatever. It's like the whole carpentry thing, you know, measure twice and cut once. Like right. you measure where you're at so you know exactly how to help yourself, you know? And people, right. are like, they're like, honestly, God, this is a funny, you'll like this actually. So I kind of coined a new term called supplement use disorder, right? And the way it evolved is that, like people would be doing great, man. They would be like losing 50 pounds and then they would just stall. They didn't start using sugar or flour again. I'm like, what the hell is going on? So we would dig into it, right? Come to find out they're, they're ingesting 20 to 30 and sometimes more supplements a day in, you know, pills and capsules and shakes and whatever. And they're, I believe, you know, I don't know for a fact, but and, you know, we got to get some testing, but I believe that their liver healed up enough from the flour and sugar to lose the first 50. And then they couldn't do it because it just kept having to process this stuff, you know, and it's not stuff that they, a doctor recommended. They just read it on the internet, said, well, I, that might help me a little. Oh, that might help. Now they're up at 20 or 30 of them. And when they stopped and they cut it way back to the thing, you know, some of them wouldn't, you know, there's like, that's why I call it a use disorder is that when they would cut way back, then the weight loss would begin again. They would they would lose the rest of the weight, right? And so I know for a fact that this is, like Lustig says, it's just not giving the liver enough break, enough air, enough breathing, healing time, you know, because right. the liver is going to be all fatty livered up anyway from sugar. And it needs to be, you know, it needs to have some... Uh, um, some yes, rest time. It needs, it needs some rest time. But you know what's amazing is how little time that liver needs. I mean, oh, the, yeah. these yeah. the responses are so quick. Yeah, yeah, no, that comes back right fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I seen as much as um like a thirty five percent reduction in liver fat in four days. Yeah, four oh, days. I, like I know Lustig's study was uh was it two weeks? We did with the kids. Like, yeah. yeah, with the kids. Yeah, it's yeah. like wow. This is this is a lot really quick. So they, if you look at it, is really not a heck of a lot that right. we're asking here. You get rid of sugar for a short period of time, and you drop liver fatness by like twenty five percent. That's that's crazy. How well, rapid that response is! It seems like the liver is the first thing that heals. Yeah, it helps all of your body that when that baby's like in oh. tip top operating shape. Yeah, I can always tell with the CGM they're bouncing. When I first get them, their their liver, you see highs followed with lows, just nonstop. Yeah. You're like, you must be just feeling horrible. You must, your mood must just be, oh, you know, yeah. out of whack. But That's you can see it on the CGM; it's measurable. That's when you good. can, when you can touch it, I like, I'd like that because then I can really teach and go, look at this date, look at this time, look what you did. Look, yeah. did what did you feel? How did you feel when when this happened? Like, ah, uh, when they learn. The light, the the light bell goes well, on. You're, you're like, actually, you know, we've kind of got a CGM meeting started here over here, and and uh, you're, yeah, you're, that's you, cool. you just you just turned on a light bulb for me, in, in that, uh, like the question is, how did you feel after this spike? If oh, I kept yeah. asking that question every time, hopefully, you know, the video game will dial them in. Like, oh, right, I get right, it. yeah, your variability today was twenty five percent. This wasn't right. a good day. Let's talk about it. Yeah. There's some new, there's a lot of really cool stuff, man. Thank you for doing this with me. This has been a fun podcast. I feel like we could talk much longer. This is really cool. Um, yeah, I, I so enjoy how can, how can people get a hold of you? Cause I know there's a lot of really, um, you've got, you've got your hands on a lot of different pots here. Yeah. Sugaraddiction.com is the, you know, kind of every home of everything, but um, the quit sugar summit, if you go there and just put your name in, you'll see Dr. Lustig giving a little testimonial and, uh, you, you just go there and, uh, you will be informed about all of our upcoming events. We have evergreen events, you know, stuff that are kind of the greatest hits stuff. And then we have the main events. We have kind of a new one coming up, um, a binge eating one, and then the big one in January. So sugaraddiction.com and quit sugar summit.com. Yeah. And, and you don't... can always find all the socials at sugar free man. Right. And don't wait till January to do this. No, and that's another thing. Hey. You know, people always say, oh, I'll just wait. I'll just wait. I'll just wait. Right. Especially at, uh, forget about after October. They're like, oh, I'll just wait till January. Yeah. 
Oh man, the time is now. The time is always now. Now well, is best. If you can get through it now in the regular life, you can get through the holidays, you know? Yeah, I think it takes too much effort to put it off and stop thinking about it. Like th that takes effort. This is something everyone needs to be doing right away. This is this is powerful stuff. Yeah, thank no, you, it, Mike. You know, thank you. I really appreciate it. It's fun to talk to you. It, was, uh, it flowed very nicely. It's uh, that was fun. The, working with the body guys, like when I'm on the keto podcast or stuff, they they're not really. Um, how should I put this? They're not really accepting of the addiction paradigm. They're like, it's it's the body, it's the body, it's the food, it's the food, you know. And, yeah. Uh, that, that doesn't work, you know, not long term anyway, short term. Yeah, addiction doesn't spare anybody. I think yeah. we all have to deal with it some yeah. way or another. And I think you're right, though, admitting right from the get-go that you have a problem is a good start. Right. Well, thank you, Mike. This is awesome. Thank you. Thank you.